Welcome. Today we have Professor David Castle with us. He is the Chair of Psychiatry at St Vincent's Health and the University of Melbourne. Thank you for coming along today. And Welcome to Melbourne One TV channel. I would like to start off um, by asking if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and the roles that you have. Thanks um, for having me today. Um, so I'm a psychiatrist, a clinical psychiatrist and also do research and teaching, so quite a diverse role and I also have a connection with the Mental Health Foundation of Australia and I'm on their board, so that's who I'm speaking on behalf of today. Well, thank you very much. Um, can you tell us a little bit right now, why do you think it's very important for us to discuss issues related to mental health at the moment? Well, of course, mental health is always important and, you know, mental health carries massive morbidity. We also are aware of um, the amount of stigma still around um, mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we're also very much aware of how common it is, so yeah. nominally one in five people. We're also aware of the um, sometimes awful outcomes which can occur um, when uh, people take their own lives, for example, as part of a mental illness. Um, and now in, in, in this particular climate, we particularly um, reminded of the risks associated with mental um, ill health and um, of course in the COVID environment after the Victorian bushfires and um, also you know unfortunately we're going to enter a phase of economic downturn and people losing jobs and so yeah. forth so all of these are, are, are social issues which are going to undoubtedly impact also on mental health so triply important. So do you think fear in these sorts of situations and in the recent pandemic, is that going to lead to more issues related to anxiety? I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever. We um, have all experienced um, some anxiety associated yeah. with um, yeah. this pandemic. And I've been saying to people, if, um, if you haven't experienced some anxiety, then there's something really wrong because we have to, we, we, we um, human organisms, we have to respond to stress um, with arousal, anxiety, that's um, the way we deal with, um, you know, fight or flight um, mechanism yeah. and um, we have to uh, be responding to threat I I yeah. in this way. Um, I think the real trick though is how we then um, understand that, accept that within ourselves and manage it and manage it in, a, in as positive a possible way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the immediate anxiety issues a, a, around this pandemic. Um, I always remind people, of course, you know, pandemics have been here forever and part of humankind. Yeah. If your life is this long, pandemic is this short. Um, so it feels very uncomfortable and unpleasant, um, but it will pass. So um, what type of long-term experiences and things do you think people might struggle with after this pandemic? So there's two ways of looking at that. One is um, the sort of sequelae in terms of some of the um, events which might have occurred and some of the associations of anxiety um, as part of the pandemic um, and that can lead to post-traumatic syndromes. Yeah. Um, the other part is the longer term consequences. For example, if you lose work, for example, if you lose a loved one, somebody dies as part of COVID, um, you know, you're going to have uh, grief and, and loss and um, all of the sequelae associated with that. And then in the longer term, as I said, um, so social issues um, such as unemployment and um, economic uh, downturn. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important to remember, um, very unfortunately, with a lot of people, you know, locked up together. Some families actually have dealt with this amazingly and beautifully and have really taken the opportunity to bond in a different way. But unfortunately, we've also seen an upsurge in domestic violence um, and that also has long term sequelae. And unfortunately, we've also seen um, some people turning to drugs and alcohol um, as a way of um, trying to cope with this. And of course, that has very detrimental effects as well. So when people are suffering with mental health issues, um, do you think it's quite normal to overthink things and overreact to things? And if it is, what are some strategies that people can use in order to overcome this? Yeah, well, as I was saying earlier, you, you know, if you didn't have some anxiety in response yeah. to a threat, and this is a real threat, um, there would be something wrong as part of what has to be a human response. Yeah. Um, and uh, the... Um, indicators that that's um, excessive or more than what is usually adaptive would be if it's very protracted, um, if it's associated with um, a lot of what we call autonomic arousal that's ongoing, you know, um, tension, yeah. um, heart racing, feelings of shortness of breath, um, so forth. 
and um, also sleep disturbance if your sleep is becoming disturbed and then if you're feeling pervasively down and depressed that you've lost interest in things that you're feeling really hopeless about things um, maybe lost your appetite lost weight um, lost hope for the future and maybe having suicidal thoughts these are really important indicators that things have got to a stage where you really need to seek help yeah, well, thank you for sharing that, definitely. And um, in recent times, we have seen a lot of um, extreme racial abuse. So, Professor, how can we deal with these sorts of things? Yes, well, um, I mean, there's been a, a number of very um, worrying issues arising in the light of, of COVID, especially um, anti-Chinese um, um, racism, which has been quite overt in, in some countries, including our own, unfortunately. Um, we are also aware, of course, of the awful um, death of, of, of a black man at the hands of the police, um, in fact, two um, in relatively recent times in the US, and that has sparked a massive um, wave of concern. Um, I think some of it's encouraging in the sense that um, in these awful circumstances, uh, people do seem to have rallied together and um, have, you know, really come out mostly to say this is just not okay, this is not, not what human society should, should stand for. So there's always some good to come out of everything, however horrible and tragic. So and what do you think about rejection and refusal um, in relation to different varying cultural backgrounds and nationality? What do you think can be done about that? Well, there's two parts to that, I guess. Um, one is um, how different cultures do respond to, to stress and threat. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a lot which is unknown about that. Um, I think we'll find out more. And certainly Mental Health Foundation is really interested in the whole multicultural mix and, and how people um, from different um, ethnic and cultural groups respond and what they find most useful mm -hmm. for them. Some, um, uh, some ethnic groups um, and cultural groups are really good at bonding together as families, um, others maybe um, less so. So we need to look at what works for some people mm -hmm. and maybe you know, we can all learn from each other yeah. about what's um, strong and, and, and adaptive. Yeah. Um, the, the other part of it is um, uh, to say that um, in the longer term, the, um, the, what we really hope is that there's not um, a pigeonholing and increased stigmatization and uh, racial vilification and all of that which can uh, sometimes grow out of um, fear really. I mean people are fearful, then they look at somebody to blame and they look at a certain ethnic group cultural group and they say well they're to blame and we've seen this throughout human history I hope that we're evolved enough within our own society and have enough experience of multiculturalism that we can avoid that uh, but we've all got a job of work to do and we need to keep reminding ourselves of this. Yeah. Now some people can tend to use um, illicit drugs and alcohol to try and release the pressure. Um, what types of long-term and short-term effects can this have on individuals? So alcohol and illicit drugs are a very, very big worry because they actually make mental health worse. People use them to so-called so, so self-medicate, um, to try and reduce anxiety, to deal with mood, but in fact um, all these drugs really have a detrimental effect in the longer term. Alcohol is particularly bad actually. Um, you know, it's a legal drug, people think, oh well it's okay then, uh, but actually it's a hugely um, dangerous drug um, in, in terms of what it does to the individual, um, causes um, depression to get worse, causes anxiety to be worse, actually isn't very good for sleep, um, causes quite disrupted sleep, mm -hmm. and um, also unfortunately leads people to uh, behave in ways which um, are really uh, not um, compatible with what we would want in terms of human beings. So aggression, violence, and we've seen domestic violence fueled by this. Also, um, you know, it can lead people uh, to be much more likely to take their own lives if they're intoxicated with alcohol. But of course, illicit drugs as well. Um, you know, we, we're very concerned about those too. Yeah, thank you. And um, in terms of treatments for mental health, um, is it just the psychiatry and behavioral medicine or are there any other lines of support available? There are lots and lots of different support structures around mental health and remember mental health should be seen as all of our issue. Um, we all either have been personally touched or 
would know people or have family members who have been touched with mental health uh, problems and um, we need to acknowledge that, we need to r rally around and assist uh, people in our own um, communities and our own families. And then um, there's lots of support lines for example, um, including Mental Health Foundation has a lot of support um, structures, um, we also have a lot of information which we can provide um, to people. Um, but then, you know, as I was getting at earlier, if you have a pervasive and persistent um, low mood or anxiety, that's really a time to reach out to professionals. So general practitioners are usually the first port of call, psychiatrists, psychologists, and you know our, our government has been very good, I think, about um, pr provision of um, extra services uh, for mental health professionals, um, and that can be done um, on uh, through um, telepsychiatry, um, and and um, we're using a lot of Zoom, for example. Um, so th these are things to use and reach out to, and you can still. Um, obey the social distancing rules um, but still get help. Don't not get help because of COVID-19 and the restrictions. Really, really important. Still seek help, follow through with that help seeking. What can the community do if they are seeing people around them who are showing symptoms? I think um, the first thing people can do is to acknowledge um, and um, reassure that uh, this is something which can be dealt with and can be helped. Um, there's still a lot of stigma around mental health problems and as you know um, that is variable across cultures as well. So I think if you're seeing somebody else struggle, ask if they're okay, validate it and say, you know, we're all feeling stressed under these circumstances, um, how are things going for you, how are you dealing with this and, um, you know, if they then open up, hopefully they open up, um, you can, you can s suggest um, some material which they might read or some um, online material which they might access um, and uh, suggest to them that they go and speak to somebody. And as I say, your GP is usually your first port of call with regard to medical care at least. Um, so is that something similar that you would offer to, let's say, individuals, your co-workers um, who are working from home and can't necessarily interact with other people? Yes, the working from home has been very yes. interesting. Some people actually love it um, and find um, it, it suits them very well and certain temperaments and certain home environments, of course. Um, but some people absolutely hate it and, you know, it's those people who are more, more likely to um, really struggle with it. Um, you're raising a very important point, though, because if we're not seeing people, um, then we might not be able to pick up. And even if you see them through... Um, Zoom or whatever, um, you still might not pick up on all the nuances which you would um, in a face-to-face -face inter interaction. So um, I, I always like um, if we're having a, a meeting um, through telepsychiatry or telehealth, um, we would go around and ask people how they're going um, in, in a um, non-challenging way. Um, just shoot the breeze a yeah. bit um, before you get down to business. What sort of advice could you offer to parents with young children, um, the ones that are struggling? Yeah, and again, we've seen quite a lot of this, that um, uh, people, especially before schools went back, people were really struggling. And uh, kids, kids um, in some ways, have been more adaptive um, on, on some levels. Um, but having uh, a lot of kids at home, and then often mum and dad also working from home, and not enough space and everybody struggling with, with everything. I think, um, again, it's about acknowledging that it's stressful. Uh, it really is difficult. Um, but also um, ensuring um, that people are checking in with each other, um, that they are aware of the supports they can access. Um, schools, I think, have been, you know, really stepped up um, and credit to teachers that they, um, you know, had to revert to an online uh, format very quickly um, and managed to do that largely well. Um, of course now people going back to school, um, it's also important to uh, keep on checking in um, and look at whether people are having uh, struggles with respect to now the, the readjustment. I've had a few uh, patients um, who report that their children are now struggling with going back to school um, because they've um, got used to uh, being at home all the time. Um, well thank you for sharing that and is there anything else that you would like to add or you would like to share with our viewers? I'd like to um, share with your viewers um, this, that we can all learn something really important from this. It's a stress, it's a massive stress. It's in our lifetimes that, you know, one of the biggest stresses across the whole globe, which we have seen. And what can we learn from that? We can learn to return to 
true values, um, family um, values which we really hold dear in terms of ourselves as human beings and social beings. And I hope we don't lose that. I hope also we might have a bit more respect for the planet um, because some, it's a bit like somebody's pushed pause um, and the planet, you know, and some environmental aspects have definitely improved. Um, and I think we need to remember that. And finally, I would hope that we avoid any um, pleasant blame game about this. As they keep on saying, we're all in this together. Well, we are in all this, all in this yeah. together. Let's hope that we can get um, some better human connections um, and better social connections going, despite social restrictions. Well, Professor David, thank you very much for your generous advice and for taking the time to come and talk to us today. Um, our viewers certainly will benefit from it and we would wish you all the best for your future as well. And again, thank you, uh, a big thank you from Melbourne One TV. And to everyone else, if you would like to see more of these types of topics being discussed in the future, please consider subscribing and give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure.